This was the moment where I knew I had to make this video. In Psychonauts, you are a child psychic training with summer camp counselor Sasha Nine to become a government agent, and he's using his psychic powers to take you into his mind to teach you combat. He's strict, calculating, and looks like if Snape went to art school. His mind is clean, orderly, precise, and doles out enemies for you at a snail's pace until you crank up the difficulty on the training program and havoc ensues. Raz, what have you done? This is not control, this is chaos. And what's brilliant about Psychonauts is what you learn about the characters by exploring the levels located within their minds. While Sasha tries to undo the damage you've wrought, his now unleashed mind creates a projection of his childhood bedroom. And if you find the memory vault hiding in the level and open it, you see slides titled Sasha's first loss, showing baby Sasha's mother falling ill and dying, leaving Sasha all alone, raised by a distant, grieving father. But that's not the moment. The moment is what breaks out after. Once you've viewed this and you see why Sasha has trained himself to become closed off and dispassionate in the face of an unfair world, a new enemy type appears for the first time. Listen to them closely. They're crying like babies just like Sasha was when he lost his mother and his heart. And the babies are running towards you with lit fuses sticking out of their heads and open arms. And if you don't shoot them before they get close to you, they explode and damage you. Oh boy, that's a lot to unpack. So let's get started. In this video, we're talking about the brilliant level design in Psychonauts and what Double Fine Productions reveals about the relationship between each character and the world inside their minds. And yes, we're doing the Milkman Conspiracy, calm down. Who are you working for? Psychonauts takes place at Whispering Rock, a summer camp for gifted psychic children to train them to use their powers to protect the world. My name. Starts with a D. Is Rasputin. You play as Raz, a child acrobat whose parents forbade him from leaving the family circus to attend the camp, so you ran away and snuck in. You've been caught, and your family will be here in 24 hours to collect you. But someone is kidnapping the gifted children and stealing their brains. You have until tomorrow to find the culprit, save the day, and convince the counselors to let you stay. But that's just the real world. Like a Zelda game, Camp Whispering Rock is in the overworld, and the dungeons are inside the minds of the game's cast, because you need to dive into them, learn new powers, and untangle their traumas to find your missing friends. If you're spoiler sensitive, we won't discuss the main plot points of Psychonauts here, but we will talk about the individual levels and what it reveals about their characters. And I'm here to recruit you for the greatest job in the world, being a psychonaut. It's about fighting a war for mental freedom. Are you ready to face torture, insanity, and death? Because this is your last chance to chicken out. Coach Oleander is a camp counselor at Whispering Rock who runs the place like a drill sergeant, and his mind is a battlefield obstacle course for you to complete. He's prepared a training area in his mind for new cadets to practice navigating the game world, and finding his first vault shows off his memories of military glory. But there's a second vault hidden behind a mental cobweb, and you won't be able to remove that cobweb until you purchase an expensive item that isn't available to you yet. So you must complete the course and get your basic braining merit badge without opening that vault, and you're never forced to come back to get it. But if you do come back after purchasing the cobweb duster and open the second vault, you'll see that Coach Oleander was never accepted into the military. He was rejected from every branch for being too short. His entire persona is a lie. Oh, and you pass by some curious meat flowers and some bunnies carved into the walls, but we will get back to those. I've been hearing a lot about head explosion, and I was wondering- Science, Rasputin. That is what we practice down here not parlor tricks. We've covered the traumatic infancy of Sasha Nine, raised by his emotionless father after losing his mother as a baby, to a teenager who apprenticed for his father, seemingly craving some parental attention denied to him earlier. The second vault we find shows us how Sasha developed his clairvoyance by reading his father's memories of his dead mother, until he found the wrong memory. Now he's a psychonaut, here to guide the next generation of psychic agents, including Raz. But to help Raz develop his talents, they need to use the Brain Tumbler machine to send Raz into his own subconscious. At first, the Brain Tumbler shows Raz exactly the mindscape you'd expect his family's old circus carriage. But then he's transported somewhere very different. He wakes up in a broken egg, in a place he doesn't recognize, with a bunny ahead of him beckoning him forward, and he's surrounded by meat. After learning your fellow campmates are also dreaming of the same place, it appears everyone's subconsciousness is being drawn here and scrambled together, including someone who wants to use the psychic children to take over the world. But Raz can't progress until he learns how to levitate, and luckily, one of the other counselors is teaching that class right now. Look who made the scene. Agent Vodello? 
Where are you? On TV, of course, where I was always meant to be. I mean, look at my hair, darling. How can hair this fabulous not be on TV? At first glance, the mind of Mia Videlo seemed pretty typical. Her mind is a vertical 70s disco club, complete with fans to blast you up to wild heights, while you learn about how to roll and soar with your new levitation powers. It's a lovely time. Her memory vault, it's all about how she's probably in love with Sasha. Honestly, she sounds adorable, and I was gonna write her up as a nice diversion until someone asked me what I thought of the orphans. And I said, what orphans? This, this is a party. And it is, until you find Mia's secret room. Difficult to reach because of the giant fan nearby blowing you away, but not impossible. Come on, this room's no fun. Let's leave, baby. But if you open the vault in here, you find out that Mia used to work at an orphanage until it burned down, with all the children inside. And that would be bad enough, but if you really want to experience Mia's nightmare, you open the chest in this room and dive inside. It's hot! So Psychonauts isn't afraid to get dark, and what we learn through the game's design is that when you're inside someone's mind, even the most experienced psychics can't necessarily hide their nightmares from you. Raz steals the psychoportal door from Sasha's lab, and now you can jump into the mind of anyone you want. So naturally, your first test is a lungfish at the bottom of the lake. Once your friends start disappearing, Raz pursues the kidnapper, a giant lungfish, across the bottom of Lake Oblongata. But Agent Cruller believes the lungfish is more afraid of you than you are of it. In the lungfish's eyes, you're the monster. And what are you and the wee one up to on this lovely day? Oh, just obeying the law as always. All posted directives followed to the letter. Ah, good to hear. Not a one of us want any trouble, that's for sure. So when you use the Psycho Portal to find out why it's been abducting your friends, you appear in the Lungfish's mind as a giant monster set on destroying a fictional city. Not long after you start stomping through Lungfishopolis, a team of freedom fighters recruit you into freeing their comrades and taking on the military for them. So you end up destroying skyscrapers and crashing through laser grids while tanks, planes, and cannons try to pummel you. It's a neat idea, but the vaults once again reveal there's more to the story, as we see that Linda the Lungfish was kidnapped and enslaved by Dr. Lobato. The freedom fighters inside Linda's mind are asking you to remove her mental conditioning. So we learn that how you appear in a mind depends on how you're perceived by the host. Sasha, Mia, and Oleander saw you as an inexperienced kid, so in their minds, you were small. In Linda's, you were a threat, so you appeared as one. Next up, we have a story about a dairy delivery person involved in a giant government plot. I guess you could call it a cheese guy scheme. No, that's not right. Wait, wait what about- uh -huh. Who are you working for? You meet Boyd Cooper outside the asylum, ranting to himself and guarding the locked entry gate. That doesn't fit in. That doesn't fit in at all. You gotta let me in. My friend's in there. Sorry, the milkman has the key. I am not the milkman. I'm the guard. So Raz jumps into his mind and ends up in a suburban house with Boyd looking through the blinds. He gives you the power of clairvoyance, allowing you to see through the eyes of other people, including Boyd's seemingly unrelated connections written all over the walls. And he tells you to dig up the milkman's grave. Oh, you'll find something all right, but it's neither man nor milk. Step outside and you're in a 1960s style suburban neighborhood, but something is wrong. You're being watched through every window, every mailbox, every trash can has eyes on you. And the neighborhood inside Boyd's mind is a spiral. Undercover spies are posing as road crews, gardeners, phone techs, and if you can find a prop similar to theirs, they respond to you as if you're one of them and let you pass. As a paranoid mind would assume, you are lying to everyone and everyone is lying to you. But they are very interested in what you know about the milkman. Who is the milkman? Why are you here? How old are you? What did the rainbow squirt tell you? Where did you get the red sign? What happened inside that house? The only ones who aren't spying on you are the Girl Scout-like rainbow squirts you find who say that you, Boyd, are creepy and they will get in trouble if they talk to you. But when they pair up, they whisper to each other constantly. You find Boyd's first vault, showing him being fired from his old job and then burning it down. He gets committed shortly after and if you didn't see this coming, He's not a guard, he's a patient. After more costume changes than Agent 47, you reach the milkman's grave and find a book. Return it to Boyd and he tells you to find the book depository and gives you a, oh no. 
You make your way to the book depository and find a parking lot full of spies posing as assassins who are all being picked off by a sniper. You sneak inside and find your shooter is a rainbow squirt. Where is the milkman? Who is the milkman? Come closer. <coughs> and <coughs> I'll, I'll tell you. <coughs> you use your clairvoyancy to scan the neighborhood and notice one house off in the distance is not what it seems. You sneak your way inside and it's full of rainbow squirts and their aggro den mother who are there to protect the milkman. You fight their leader, Have defeat her, and the milkman, Please. Boyd, awakens. I am the milkman. My milk is delicious. So red white with his rage. The government agents and carfuls of sensors immediately roll up on you, but Boyd has been set free. And it's time to deliver the milk. Special delivery today. Snap out of Boyd's mind and he opens the gate for you. He doesn't care about guarding this place anymore. He has a Boyd? new mission okay? now. Time for the final delivery to this address. What's unique about the Milkman conspiracy is this level has no sensors until the Milkman's location is revealed. And while we've been fighting sensors throughout this game, this level shows what can happen when someone has no sensors to stop their incorrect thoughts. Tonight, I will be playing the part of Gloria Von Guten, the famous actress. If you're also a recovering theater kid like me, you're probably in therapy. And you probably enjoy this next level. You meet Gloria Von Guten, a former child star and now asylum resident in the garden where she fawns over an acting trophy. But when she steps out of a literal spotlight, her mood swings and she chases you off. Are you trying to take it? Because you don't think I deserve it. I just wanted you to love me. Hey! What? You're supposed to be dead! The only way past her is to use the portal into her mind and find out how to stabilize her. Welcome to Gloria's Theater. Inside her mind, you have a running series of play scenes that switch between happy and sad versions of the same story, and a haggard stage manager who can't get the star out of her dressing room. Benita Soleil, the standard for Gloria, won't come out on stage while the critic is in the audience heckling her performance. Kid, can't you see I'm trying to have a moment here? That's right, Gloria has her own mental critic in a private box who is mocking her acting. And when Benita finally comes out on stage and the critic jeers her performance, not again! The phantom strikes. So Gloria has a phantom that lives up in the catwalks, and whenever Benita Soleil puts on a poor performance, an actor dies. To get up to the catwalks, Raz has to find the right play script, give it to the actors, and then switch the tone to either happy or sad to find the set that lets him ascend. As the scenes play out, we learn of Gloria being shipped off to boarding school by her actress mother becoming a child star on Broadway and ultimately eclipsing her mother's acting career. But when performing abroad in Paris, her mother threw herself off a theater's catwalks to her death. Gloria was never the same and her career cratered. Raz climbs up to stop the Phantom, but instead he finds the critic. I totally guessed that. After a climactic boss fight where the critic shoots hurtful insults at you, the critic shrinks until he's no longer seen nor heard. With a phantom vanquished and the critic defanged, we depart Gloria's mind, and Gloria departs the asylum. While the level isn't subtle about Gloria's critic personifying her insecurities, this does give you the first chance to directly fight what is tormenting your host. Come to think of it, if I had just punched the critic when we first met like I wanted to, this level would have lasted five minutes. That is my patron, my psychiatrist, my warden. Looks like Dr. Lobato to me. Is he the one who chained you up? The doctor won't let me go until I complete my treatment. So why don't you just finish the painting and go home? Why don't I just... Edgar is a Spanish painter who can't finish his portrait of Dr. Lobato, and until he does, he can't leave the hospital. Upon entering Edgar's mind, he's building a tower of playing cards to reach a woman that Edgar doesn't know, but feels compelled to climb to. You volunteer to find the missing cards that Edgar needs to finish his tower, reach his goal, and complete his painting. But within the alleys of this quaint little Pamplona-like town is the rampaging bull, El Odio. 
so you'll have to acrobat your way above him to reach each queen to collect or use paintings as portals between sections of the city. Because for Edgar, Art is our only escape. Picking up each card requires you to defeat a luchador. Because, wait, this level was about art and bullfighting, not wrestling. But whatever, they're just mini bosses, right? Okay. You find new art from the dogs in the infamous Dogs Playing Poker on Velvet painting, but while the first two support Edgar's story about his lost lover flamenco dancer who ran off with Edgar's rival, bullfighter Dingo in Flagrante, the third tells a very different story about Edgar being a high school wrestler who blew a big state meet because his girlfriend left him for a fellow cheerleader. Edgar's girlfriend Lana Panzoni dumped him after the first period for Dean Legrand, the head of her cheerleading squad. Technically was worthless after that. The other team just tossed him around the rest of the day like a half sack of pork rinds. His teammates were all out to pummel him for costing them the championship, so Edgar ate lunch every day in the art teacher's classroom. Upon diving into Edgar's subconscious sewer, there's the remains of a high school classroom and gymnasium, and it becomes clear that Edgar's persona as a tortured Spanish artist is a lie. He's constructed this version of reality and convinced himself it's real. The luchador fights become matches with Edgar's high school wrestling teammates, and Raz has to fight them all if he wants the cards to finish the tower. Hey, Edgar. Nice headgear, freak. Upon receiving his cards, Edgar disappears. Raz climbs the card tower, and the imprisoned woman thanks us for rescuing her. I knew you would save me someday. He just won't let me go. Tell me. How did you kill him? Kill who? El Odio. I didn't. Edgar? Edgar is not the hero. He's the bull. She actually a stand-in for Edgar's high school girlfriend, and the matador, the cheerleader guy she left Edgar for, say they're happy together. But Edgar won't let them go. First, Raz uses his powers to slow Edgar's rampage, but when Dingo says he'll be killing the bull, Raz switches gears and saves Edgar while turning the bullfighting spears on Dingo using telekinesis. Raz convinces Edgar that the Varsity Cheer Squad isn't worth ruining his life over, and Edgar, seeing them beaten, is finally able to move on. So characters in Psychonauts are able to construct elaborate fantasies to protect themselves from a harmful truth, and sometimes the only way to help them is to guide them towards accepting it. Attack! No, wait! Don't listen to him! Retreat! Shut up, you fool! The battle is ours! Wellington is on the run! This is our moment of glory! Oh, shut up, you loon. The battle can't be won! We're gonna lose it! I'm afraid you lost it years ago, Fred. When now we first down. meet former Chief Orderly Fred Bonaparte, now donning a handsome straitjacket himself, he switches personalities back and forth between the real one and his distant ancestor, French military leader Napoleon Bonaparte. When Raz pops into Fred's mind, he sees that Fred is locked in a battle of wits with Napoleon over a strategy game similar to Risk, where Napoleon is determined to teach Fred to stop being such a loser. Only problem is, Fred could couldn't care less about winning the game. He's lost all interest in victory, but until he wins, Napoleon won't let him go. I was forced to take control, and I will stay in control until I beat the love of victory into this degenerate swan who dares to cut himself a Bonaparte. Locked away in his memory vaults, Fred started playing this game with a patient in the asylum as a way to bond. But losing to that patient repeatedly started driving him mad, and that's when his Napoleon personality began to split from his loser self. Raz dives into the game board and interacts with the player pieces to find reinforcements and take on Napoleon's advancing army. Fred's problem isn't that he can't win, it's that he doesn't care about winning. But to win over enough recruits to turn the tide of the game, Fred will have to show the peasants that he wants to win and support them in their fight, and then Raz can get them the gear they need to take on Napoleon's troops. When Fred storms Napoleon's stronghold and wins the game, Napoleon disappears. I guess anyone can lose themselves in the wrong hobby. Coach Oleander? What are you doing in my mind? How do you get in my happy meadow? Nobody's supposed to know about it. You didn't tell my dad about it, did you? <laughs> and finally, when Raz and Oleander's consciousnesses intertwine, we get the meat circus. Coach Oleander's childhood self was traumatized by his butcher father, and Raz was traumatized by his acrobat father, and now the two worlds are colliding. 
Raz meets a version of Coach Oleander's childhood self who goes by Ollie and wants to introduce Raz to his bunny, which has appeared before in Coach Oleander's training battlefield, but also in the brain tumbler experiment after Raz touched Oleander's mind. But now they're stuck in the circus that Raz performs in, except the circus is made entirely of meat, and nearby grinders spawn creatures that are out to get Ollie. Now Ollie's trying to save the pet bunny, and Raz is trying to save Ollie as he continues to ascend up the high wire trapeze zone and take on Coach Oleander's father, a giant butcher. This looks like the work of mentalists. I can explain. Have you been associating with psychics? But Raz's father, convinced that his whole family was cursed to die in water by psychics, is flooding the circus to drown Raz. He torments his son, tossing flaming circus pins at him while Raz tries to stay one step ahead of the water. And we finally get a glimpse of why Raz ran away from home. It seems that for everything Oleander and Raz know about other mental worlds, they're just as susceptible as everyone else to letting their own demons torment them. But unlike most people, they have the tools to defeat them. Psychonauts may be fairly criticized for simplifying the difficult process of overcoming mental trauma, but it's one of the best examples of designing levels in gameplay around character. With a sequel coming out, I hope you'll be looking forward to jumping back into some brains. I know I will. Is that a piece of bacon? Oh yeah, I just love bacon. I smell that stuff and I can't help it. I drop everything and come running. <laughs>